uh, Spring Gardening 101. And this is going to be a lot of great information thrown at you. And I'm, I'm just going to throw in, give a bit of an intro for Emily, since she'll be the one taking us through this. Uh, so Emily Murphy, she's native to Northern California. For, so for all of you out there that live in that area, this is going to be perfect for you. Uh, she's a fantastic communicator and just really, really well. I love Emily's type of writing because she's able to take those principles, um, like permaculture principles and, and natural principles and be able to just share them in such an easy and simple way. Like I often feel like gardening, uh, it doesn't follow rules, right? It follows guidelines. And Emily just does such a great way of just giving that to, to people in a really simple manner. So I, I often open up her book when I need a bit of inspiration in the garden or just to remember that I'm connected to nature in some way and connected to the bigger problems of climate change and, uh, and food security just through my little garden. So I've, I'm really, really enjoying, I'm really enjoying Emily's book. And yeah, I urge you, if you're new to gardening, pick it up. I, I got it on Kindle for a few bucks and it was great. I really enjoyed it. So I'm super, super glad to have Emily here today and to run us through uh, a bit about Grow Now and how to bring life back into your soils. Because this webinar is, is about spring gardening, but you will learn through this webinar how important it is to look at your soils. So I've got, I'm going to put take put Emily on the stage now and I will pop up a, a little poll for all of us and I just want to see what everybody's level of gardening is and this will kind of dictate how we are going to run the webinar if you're brand new uh, pop it in there if you've been gardening for a few years for your experienced gardener just pop them in there and yeah we'll get a bit of an idea it's interesting it's all going up and down right now it's really exciting for me on this end I can see it all but I'm going to bring Emily to the stage while everybody, we've almost got everybody in here. Fantastic. Emily, welcome. Hi. welcome. welcome. Hi. How are you? Thanks. I'm so excited to be here. I, I've been really looking forward to this ever since uh, you approached me with the idea of sharing concepts from Grow Now and talking about soil, which is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, it touches on so many areas that are uh, near and dear to my heart and I think also important for the greater conversation uh, around growing and biodiversity and the planet and where we're headed and what we can do uh, and there's hope in action and there's uh, real tangible hope in the everyday things that we grow. Uh, that's I, I, I want to kick off the question with because we, we were going to start this off in your garden uh, but it wasn't working out. So people can't see the garden behind you, but maybe you can bring us into some of the curiosity. What's, what I love about your book is that you kind of bring out the little kid in me sometimes and I, I get really curious about things. So what's lining up your curiosity in your garden right now? Yeah, yeah, um, good point. So uh, just so the viewers know, I was trying to set up in the garden outside and uh, the day wasn't cooperating. It's quite sunny and then the trees are just filling in because it is... Uh, just becoming spring here, truly becoming spring with the, the leaves leafing out. And uh, and then everyone decided to travel somewhere at once. I live kind of near a corner. And so there was lots of street noise. So we're inside. Uh, this is my house. And um, uh, so what are some of the things that are sparking my curiosity right now? Um, and I, I first off, I love that word. I think it's a word we need to be um using a little more often and also honoring a little more in the sense that our curiosity is one of our best tools for growing anything and caring for soil, uh, as is paying attention. Uh, and right now, my curiosity, this is my first year in this garden, my first full year. Uh, this this garden was um, formed a year ago today, actually. I built raised beds. I filled those beds um, using a no-dig approach, which is basically composting in place where you put sticks and twigs, brown materials, greens on tops, browns, greens, compost on top. I planted 
straight in that. And three months later, I had this amazing garden. Uh, I'm so lucky for that. And now this is my first year, right? First full year of really watching how that process worked. And I'm curious to see where it leads me. I'm also giving myself room to slow down a little bit. Last year, I felt like I was racing time. And as we were, as, as we were talking about earlier, um, you know, trying to manage my growing season and mm -hmm. squeeze that in. And now I'm really looking at slowing down a little bit, taking it all in, not being in a rush, letting it be okay to say, not plant my tomatoes on time or not plant my peppers on time and really enjoy the process and and also take in because this is my first year in this on this property we lived in the same we lived in a rental for 10 years and last year we moved um anyone who follows me on instagram will kind of follow that process but uh also take in who's visiting the garden uh, what birds are, are coming through and when, and what are their activities? Oh, this is when the towhees come through and eat off all the tops of the kale leaves. Um, my, my, my tree, not my tree collars, but they really like the dino kale, the Tuscan kale, or, or um, what, you know, is there more soil life? Are there more worms in my, in my soil? Uh, you know, how did my raised beds that I built with um, a composting technique, this lasagna gardening or hugo culture, how did they perform? Well, they actually did really well. Um, and, and those types of questions. And do so you it's keep really, a logbook, Emily? Yeah. Do you keep a logbook too? Because there's a lot, of, a lot of questions, a lot of information that come at you. So how do you, how do you keep track of it all? Uh, that's a really good question. So I did write a book. I, I did do that, yeah. but I'm, <laughs> <It's true. laughs> but I'm, I'm First really terrible. I'm really terrible with, um, journaling and, uh, when it comes to keeping track of the garden and what I find myself doing is the easiest thing is that I'll go into my calendar on my computer and I'll type in last spring frost, I think, and I'll type in oh, I saw these or oh, I saw that. So then the year, the next year I can go back and look through my calendar. It's kind of a sift, but it's so much more efficient because otherwise I might not write it down at all. And also mm -hmm. I cool. think as you, as you, so right now we're looking at, um, we're looking at the poll and as it's coming in, it looks like most of you have had a few years of gardening experience. Some of you are experienced, some of you are brand new. And those of you who are, um, who have had a few years experience. So I'm just going to share yeah. that poll for everybody yeah. that so we can all see where <coughs> we're at, but please continue. I'll share yeah. the results. Oh yeah, there they are. Yeah. So most of you have had a few years of gardening. And I think, I think what we find when you have a few years of gardening under your belt is that uh, you, you just start to, it's, it's sort of like osmosis. And yes, taking down notes is really important. What worked well, what didn't well. But for me, I'm constantly making a mental catalog of, oh, I'm not growing that again. Or, oh, hey, I need to build in more habitat for wildlife. Or, oh, hey, I, I need to, next year I, I wanna do this. Or next year I'm definitely growing that indigo apple um, tomato because that was incredible. Mm -hmm. And I, I keep those in my role, my mental Rolodex uh, and, and anything I'm concerned, I won't remember I put into my calendar. I have tried to keep a journal oh God, yeah. um, and I highly recommend journaling. Actually, that's what I, I tell everyone else to do. But yeah. um, you I'm know, the same. Work, I don't know, work with it, what you have, work with what. Yeah, I, I'm exactly the same because part of me, I know it's really good to to, to journal and to keep notes but sometimes it can it can stop the flow of my creativity and fun I'm like oh now i've got to take this down and like lose my little kid inside absolutely and that's actually a really interesting point that you made so you said the word flow and a little kid and i think i actually was thinking about this this morning before our conversation i actually took a little i took a little break and i went surfing and yes. I just needed to get in my body and out of my head and I needed some flow and I just needed it in a different environment. So I went and, and then when I was out there, I was thinking, okay, so what is it about growing and gardening? Well, it is truly this opportunity for flow and it's right outside your door or in those containers and you can, you can leave some of the cares behind mentally, you get in your body, you get in the moment, you're just in it, 
which is such a lovely thing to be directly connected to nature on some level. And, and then also there's these other physical benefits, right? So when you touch soil or compost for that matter, but when you get your hands in soil, it releases serotonin in your body. It makes mm -hmm. you feel better, decreases stress, elevates mood. I mean, there's looking at plants does the same thing. There's so many wonderful things about it, but it puts you in that flow and immediately connects us to our ageless selves, I, I believe. And you'll see that it grow now is one of those books that has all the the, the principles of of how to grow. But I really pull in a lot of the ideas that we're talking about here, and and uh, one of the questions I ask is it's a rhetorical question is, you know, when you were a child, you played in the dirt. Why did you mm -hmm. ever stop? And it's not meant to ne necessarily be answered so much as to, to be um, considered and to consider ourselves as people on this planet that we're earthlings or earth things, we're things of this earth and, and we're not separate from it and growing and all the things we're talking about here are such a wonderful gift. So. That's, that's a great segue into the first slide I wanna get into because you've got a image in your book about the relationship between plants and soil. And I just want to show it to everybody here uh, for you to dig into, Emily. Is that all right? That sounds great. Fantastic. And so I've got this up here. And these questions on the side here, why is life and my soil important? Can you explain the, the image that's going on here on the right? Yeah, so uh, this is one of my favorite illustrations from Grow Now. It's illustrated by Rachel Victoria Hillis. And this illustration is in the segment of the book or the section of the book that talks about how regenerative growing or regenerative gardening works. And the regenerative process is really a simple process of, of regrowing nature and working with nature and how nature grows itself to grow our own gardens or grow our landscape our landscapes or rewild our landscapes or our food systems. And in this particular illustration, which I love so much, she did such a great job of, I had all these hen scratches and ideas for how it could come together and, and she did this. So you can see that um, it is from the book because it's numbered and I, I won't go exact into what exactly each of those numbers refers to because I can't remember the order in the book. But what's happening here is it's showing this incredible interconnectedness of biodiversity and the relationship between nature and plants or plants and, and um, other organisms. And what we have then is uh, the idea that when you feed the soil with carbon uh, carbon has had a, a has a bad rap, right, because of its overabundance in the atmosphere. But in reality, carbon is the food of life. And when scientists, for instance, go to look for life out in the universe, they look for signs of carbon-based life paired with water. And when you start looking at life on Earth, everything has carbon in it. It's essential for life. And when we think about feeding our gardens, we think of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. But in reality, carbon carbon's the first thing we want to give our gardens because we're really then feeding these soil microbes, which are um, implied in this illustration. And you can see down by number three, it looks like um, some type of fungi, which it's that's what it's meant to be. And the green coming out from that. And the U.S., my, I studied botany, and so my botany professors use... Uh, pronounced fungi fungi i know everyone has their own way of pronouncing it but, <laughs> but you you can see i'm so, so aware of that because i listen to how other people pronounce fungi oh fungi fungi uh fungi um so you can see number three there's fungi there and out from that are these mycelia and the mycelium of the fungi then create relationships with organisms in the soil and with plant roots. 90 to 95% of plants form relationships with mycorrhizal fungi. And it's, it extends plants, plants reach. Uh, there, there's a barter system, not just with fungi, but with bacteria where they share um, water and precious nutrients. Uh, you know, plants, of course, are, are creating their own food from the sun uh, and they shuttle down that carbon, those sugars through their, through their plant bodies into their plant roots and out through the plant roots, those are root exudates. And it's the fungi and bacteria that benefit from those root exudates, in particular, the fungi. And, uh, and again, there's this barter system. I like to think of it as the underground superhighway. 
And this is really where a lot of magic begins. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying that's a really good way to explain it, the barter system, because they're giving, uh, they're giving, they're feeding the microbes below, and the microbes are also performing or giving nutrients back to them or protecting them. And it's just a, it's something that we don't see. And this blows my mind. We don't see it, but it's just happening underground all the time. Uh, and there's so much complexity behind it. Uh, I would love I, they're, to, they're, I'm, I'm going to pop it back on our, our face. Oh, do, will you finish up with this? Oh, well, can I just say one other thing? But I, I so appreciate that. Okay, so there's so much more to this illustration uh, that goes into regenerative gardening, such as keeping living roots in the ground. Living roots continually feed the soil ecology. Um, planting perennials is an important one. But if you see here, we have insects above this illustration. Mm. And what we often forget is that the soil ecology, the ecology in soil, is directly connected to the health of the ecology above ground and vice versa. And when we care for soil and we feed soil carbon and uh, plant roots and we care for it with, for with, uh, by avoiding digging or disturbing the soil, uh, we care for that soil ecology, which then immediately fosters biodiversity above ground. And it's this fabulous push and pull and interconnection that, that I think we forget for exactly the reason that you're saying, which is, well, we don't see what's happening underground, but we know it's something's happening or we think we do. Uh, and Or maybe when we're kids, we learned that there was something like that and we forget along the way but go ahead i we can move on i love this topic so i'm really happy you brought it up no we'll, we'll keep digging into it we'll dive in a little bit deeper i had this i had this poll uh for people to tell us how much they understand about their soils and i thought it'd be really cool to see because as you're saying emily gardening and biodiversity it all connects back to the soil and when we feed the soil and look after it, it also it does all has all these other beneficial byproducts. And I often see it as like the stream at the very top. And when the stream flows down, it ends up feeding all these other pools and soils is, is at the top there. Uh, but I want to dive into if brand new beginner, uh, even though we've got a lot of first, second year gardeners here and looking at the poles here. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, as the polls are going up, we've got how much do you understand about soils? Very little. I'm just going to end it, guys, and we'll share this. Because even though we've got a lot of first and second year gardeners, majority of people have said they understand very little about their soils. Um, so that's interesting. I find that I find it interesting. And I'm actually speaking to a lot of gardeners. That's usually the case. Do you have the same, have you had the same experience, Emily? Uh, as far as uh, the people I speak to or communicate yeah, with having little understanding. Well, I would say that's true. I would say that's true partly because, um, partly because of lack of knowledge. I think that we just haven't been talking about it until recently, at least quite yeah. a bit. The permaculture movement really helped with that, but uh, I think the regenerative movement is is helping more. And then your work, of course, with Subpod and uh, conversations around composting and how important it is. Hopefully we can make it sexy again and it becomes, you know, again, maybe it never was, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, something, that, something that we're all really curious about and understanding yeah. that, um, that you know, right now, the majority of the, of, the carbon on earth is still held in soils. And um, what is it like 40% is in peat bogs and 3% yeah. of peat bogs on the plant. There's 3%, uh, the land mass is covered with 3% peat bogs, if I'm saying that correctly. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. incredible how much, how much carbon is held in the ground or in systems um, in the ground. And, uh, and when we begin unraveling that, I think that we, there's some shock and awe and then, and then we start to look at our our gardens or our landscapes uh, a little bit differently and with curiosity, which I think is such, again, such an important word. And and I think that it doesn't mean we have to be soil scientists. And I, I talk mm -hmm. about this um, uh, when it comes to say, examining your nature quotient and cultivating your nature quotient, which is how well you understand the natural world. It doesn't mean you have to know the scientific name of every plant and animal, uh, just like it doesn't mean you have to be a soil scientist, but 
it does help to pay attention and it does help to, uh, as I was just saying about my own garden, watch to see what's happening in the soil, who's visiting. And, um, and I see here that enough people, there's, there's a, several people who say, well, I know enough to know what good soil is. And that's, mm -hmm. that's actually an excellent start. And, and my hope with say grow now and also with with your work is that uh, we if we begin um, providing the language to articulate and frame uh, this conversation around soil that it becomes commonplace and uh, and then we can take it into our everyday lives to really make meaningful impact that's lovely and i want to go into nq a little bit more because that was a great uh, yeah, that, that was really cool. I, I, I'm reading that in your book and applying that. And uh, did you coin that phrase? I know someone else asked me that because I, I couldn't find it. it anyway. Oh, you couldn't? No. Could, well, maybe I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, someone else. I found it somewhere, and I, I, I really wanted to pull that into the conversation. Mm. And so, if you think about it, your EQ, or well, let's go back. IQ, your ability to reason, your EQ is your emotional quotient, and that is uh, really your ability, ability to collaborate and understand others. Uh, but what about your NQ, your nature quotient? And when I'm looking at where we are with the climate crisis and species extinction and the conversations that are currently happen happening around that, um, if we back up and talk about William McDonough, who's the founder, author of Cradle to Cradle, the way he frames it is, you know, the way our society has approached this is uh, to drive less, pollute less, waste less, uh, and to be less bad. He says, how about turn this idea on its head? What if we actually do more good? Mm. Doesn't that make you feel better right away? I feel better. And, and I took this idea and ran. You'll see one of the chapter names is Grow More Good. And I wanted to continue the idea of reframing. And that's where I pulled in the nature quotient because it's something so important to me. And if we're going to look to nature-based solutions such as composting or applying compost, growing a habitat, growing some of our own food, uh, then, then developing your nature quotient seems to be a reasonable and likely place to begin. Even if you don't know that much about growing, just developing your nature quotient immediately gives you a leg up. And I think it helps us understand our connectivity with nature that includes our gardens and our and that we are nature um, our health you know we're only as healthy as the environment in which we live and our food is only as vital and nutritious as the environment in which it's grown so, and that's the soil how would you apply that concept to the question how would i determine life in my soil or how healthy my soil is if i was a brand new gardener and i've like does my soil have health in it or not? Like what, what would be some of the indications I would use with my NQ? Uh, well, you would look at it first. You'd pick mm -hmm. it up. You might even, I know I was talking about no, no dig. You might even uh, pull back the soil to see what's happening um, in a core sample, say. You could send it in for testing, yes. And that's what I did when I moved here into this new place. I wanted to see what the pH was, you know, what the really pH, uh, because pH affects which plants I can and can't grow unless I want to correct the pH, uh, um, at least for any in-ground plantings. So yes, you can send it in for testing, but usually testing really gives you just these analytical mm -hmm. uh, um, analyses of, of, you know, again, pH, um, your NPK ratio, how you might feed your soil. Uh, but in reality, for what we're doing, what we're talking about is you look at it, you smell it. Does it smell good? If it smells good, it's probably full of bacteria. And one bacteria in particular creates that smell, but it's probably full of, of bacterial life. Uh, how do the plants look? That are growing mm -hmm. in it. So, so if you pick up the soil, so backing up to the first concept, if you pick up your soil and it's cloddy and it break, it falls apart, it doesn't hold together. Um, it's uh, and and this might be inherent to certain soils. I did live in the high mountains um, above six thousand feet in the Sierra Nevada range for a number of years. It's high desert. The soils are are not super. Um, super high on the life scale because it's so arid and that's the nature of those soils. So you do have to consider your region where you come from, what the parent mm -hmm. materials are. But in general, in our gardens, if you, if you pick up the 
the soil, if it if it looks good, if it's deep dark brown, if it smells good, it's, there's probably something really good going on. If it's not looking like that, you can also look around to see what's growing. Like if you have a lot of dock, I'm sure you call it dock there. What's the um, mm -hmm. yep. dock? Yeah. So dock is one of those plants that tends to grow in poor soil, compacted soil. Uh, you know, okay, I need to work on my soil. But what's really wonderful, even if you're working with soil that seems fine, uh, you can immediately improve it by applying compost to the soil surface and uh, which is amazing, right? And and you can that's, do, I know, and you, that's one step. I know, uh, that's, sorry, I didn't interrupt, but like, that's a really good segue yeah. into the next, into the-, the Let's talk about of, the next, yeah. From your book, let's, because I think a question that often comes up is, can you regenerate any soil? And there is this, this case study from your book, can you explain to us this development that's happened here and what's actually going on. It's community market, natural forest in Santa Rosa, California. What's going on here, Emily? Yeah, yeah. So this is a, a happy chance that I came across this garden. Uh, the, the place where the garden actually is, it's this strip along um, the side of a building that's across the street from the community market. Uh, and the building's actually a brewery. <laughs> it's a pub. And the pub, the owners of the pub ha are working in collaboration with uh, people who work at the community market to, to regenerate this strip of land, which you can see in the top left image. Uh, that image is taken closest to the corner where the uh, where the garden area has yet to be regenerated. Nothing has been done to that space. But what we know is that the entire strip once looked like this top left corner. And then um, to the right of that in the top right corner, you'll see an area that um, is about to be worked on. It, and there's compost on the ground. Uh, sadly, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, they threw it on the ground and they didn't cover it. And so it's it's becoming hard and dry and crumbly, yeah. but they're doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. And then, then you see in the middle, uh, in the middle left, this is the space. Uh, it, so where I'm standing to take this picture, this is basically the space. If I were to turn look left, I would be looking down on that, on that oh, middle left image, right? Because yeah. it's this progression. It's this long strip. And here, what they've done which I think is so fabulous. I'm so glad I was there when this was in process is they've taken six to eight inches of compost. So a lot of compost, they mm -hmm. put it directly on the ground, the ground you see up there. They did nothing to it before. They didn't need to because everything was uh, dead, right? If you were working with a space where you had a lawn and the lawn was tall or you had lots of weeds, you would want to mow them down or cut them back uh, before beginning this process. They didn't need to do that. They placed the six to eight inches of compost, really healthy layer, and they planted directly into the compost. And the cinder blocks are there to hold the compost in place while the roots take hold. Once the roots take hold, then you have the bottom image. You don't need the cinder blocks anymore because the plants are, um, are holding it all together. And so this the bottom image and the image on the right are the areas that have already been regenerated. These are the plants that are growing in the regenerated space. And you can see how intensively they're planting and how much they have packed into this one space. That's incredible. How long did this process take, this succession? From the, this yeah, thing? so from what I know, the bottom image and the one on the right, that was about two years into this process. Okay. And it, it's all volunteer and, uh, they are, you know, they invest in the compost. That's the one part where they all come together and chip in is to pay for the compost. And they grow a lot of their own plants from starts. And it turns out the pub also has bees. They keep bees on the, their rooftop. And they're really trying to be an example, a lead, you know, leader and show what's possible even in the most unlikely spaces. And you can imagine if you're walking down the street if you were walking down the sidewalk in the top image, you wouldn't think you, you, that's no. not a place you want to stop and linger, but yeah. this bottom image, whoa, I want to stay and hang out. I loved taking pictures there. It was really remarkable. That's, that's such a good point. And uh, I'll jump into I mean, talking, going back to the biodiversity, uh, we're restoring the soils and then you've got a lovely place to hang out. 
not only us, the insects have a lovely place to hang out now, we're talking about insects, insect highways, and we're talking about the birds and, and how this ripple effect happens. Re regenerative gardening, it's been a bit of a, a, a buzzword, thankfully, uh, and a lot of people here would have seen kiss the ground, but how do you bring those regenerative practices, which they talk a lot about in farming, into your garden? Is it, is, is it possible? What, what do you do, Emily? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, so what they've done here at the community market in Santa Rosa is the regenerative process. Uh, to to I mean, there are some perennials. I think the only thing might be to add more perennials to the space. Uh, hmm. But really, you can scale the regenerative process for organic farming uh, to the home garden or to any landscape, which is what I think is so fabulous about it because. The tenants are truly so simple, and they're they're common sense uh, practices, uh, and and they're a set of principles that they're really so old they seem new. I'm sure that our, our grandparents were farming this way. I think about my great grandfather who immigrated from Italy to Northern California, and and the I he wasn't alive when I was a child, but I was on his farm and where he planted his trees and I saw how he grew his garden. My, my great grandmother was still living when I was a kid. And um, you can see he was using a mix of permaculture principles and, and, and regenerative principles to grow in this pretty harsh landscape in reality. Uh, and so it's something I think that it, that people have been practicing for quite a long time, but we're just circling back to, which I think is so valuable and the principles are really uh, keep living roots in the ground, which, which we talked about sooner uh, earlier. And that's something you can do by um, planting perennials, uh, uh, growing cover crops, ground covers. Um, uh, and um, there was another one I wanted to add in cover crops, ground covers. It'll come to me. Perennials. And, and then, of course, um, well, so those living roots it? right there. Or would you yeah, count can you hear me? Cover crop? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, I, uh, that's a, Is it that's cutting a, out? Whole, a whole bunch of information, I think, for people that there's so many different ways, as you're saying, to, to bring that regenerative, those regenerative principles back into your garden. And I think what's really cool in your book and how we've started this conversation is to keep that curiosity going because that curiosity is going to lead you and that observation uh, and making those little tweaks. We're like, oh, that, because ultimately your teacher is your garden, right? <laughs> that's the one that's going to tell mm -hmm. you if you're doing, if you're doing the right things. Um, but I, I want to, I know you're really into no dig gardens and I want to see if everybody else is is on the same page here or has tried no dig gardening so there's a poll for everybody yeah, right now it. so have you ever tried no dig gardening before and emily's going to walk us through it and we've got a little diagram uh, that we'll put up for you and it's it's up and down it's okay fantastic we'll just keep that going for a couple more seconds and it looks like 71% of us have never done no dig gardening. So great opportunity, Emily, to walk us through what no dig gardening is and, and how that works. Do yeah, yeah. So that's another tenet of, of the regenerative process, which you don't have to remember these principles exactly, but that's an important one because it goes back to the first slide, which was the ecology of soil and fostering that soil ecology. That soil ecology then helps support our plants and uh, supports the biodiversity above ground. And, and um, we are protecting that soil ecology when we take a no dig approach. And we're feeding that soil ecology, right? When we, when we feed our gardens compost or our landscapes compost and, we're, and we keep living roots in the ground. Those, those all work together. And in this no dig approach, I know it can seem counterintuitive. Grow a garden without digging. How the heck do I do that? Because <laughs> uh, inherently, right, you're in the, you're in the going to dig a hole to plant a seed or, you know, move soil aside to plant a seed or uh, I'm planting uh, a, 
I'm rewilding my front my front uh, yard right now into a garden and I'm planting these plants in one gallon containers. And so yes, I have to dig a hole big enough to support the root system of the plant I'm planting. That's really all you need to do. And, and past that planting question, how do I plant if I plant no dig or how do I how do I care for the soil if I can't till it? Well, this goes back to, again, some of the ideas we were talking about earlier, which was applying compost to the soil, which is what they did at, at, at in the Santa Rosa Community Market Garden. Uh, they, they, they didn't move or disturb the soil under that compost. They just put the compost directly on top of it. And uh, there's other principles you can use or other practices you can use, such as sheet mulching, where you take newspaper or cardboard, place that down, wet it down, and then put compost on top of that. Um, and then there's lasagna gardening. There's a number of ways to layer organic matter on soil. But what it comes back to is that you're layering up rather than digging right. down. And you're relying on the way nature grows itself and how soil ecology works to then do its job. You're trusting that nature is going to do its job, which it has done its job for gobs and gobs of years without any help from us. And, um, and why is that better? Why, yeah. why is that better than tilling? Like, why is it better to lay out? How does that promote soil life more opposed to digging it up and tilling? Yeah, well, if you think about it from that first slide, the 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 structure of soil between the plant roots and the the, the mycorrhizal fungi that are living in soil, the microbes and those wonderfully intricate intricate relationships, you dig and you till, and um, it's like opening up a wound, and then all of those relationships have to heal and reestablish themselves. And if they're left in place, they can better support your plants. Uh, and and continue growth of plants. There's something, and I and I know we've seen modern farming, tilling, and 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 um, and growing crops year after year. But what we're finding is this this is a, a dead end approach. And we're also finding that the more we till, not only are we destroying the soil ecology, but we're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Mm. And uh, that process is only continuing when we continue these practices, these conventional practices uh, versus uh, regenerative practices. And what we know is it's no longer enough to be sustainable, uh, let alone continue conventional farming practices. Uh, and I know it's not easy for farmers who are uh, truly trying to live their lives and, and, and make mm. a living and, and we're all doing the best we can. We only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know, uh, which is why I'm so glad we're having this conversation because there are a number of examples of thriving regenerative farms and there are expenses such as compost. That'll probably be the, the biggest expense. But once, if you can't make enough on your own plot, which I, I, I know for the larger systems, that's the case. And, uh, um, but this regenerative process is possible and the no dig process is possible. So if we skip tilling, we, we preserve the ecology of soil, which inherently then preserves and protects the biodiversity above ground. What we know mm -hmm. is that we're, we're facing this, the sixth mass extinction. We're, we're looking at losing 25% of uh, plant and animal species across the globe in the coming decades. That's, you know, a million plant and animal species. That's an incredible number and, and, some of those organisms are soil organisms. We also we also are realizing that of all the insect life on the planet, we we really have only named and understood and cataloged twenty percent of those insects. Blows my mind. That blows my mind when I hear that. It's I know, and so many insects depend upon the the health of soil as their home. Uh, when you think of we think of bees as these creatures that live above ground, but so many yeah. bees, native bees in particular, make their homes in in the ground itself. And um, and That's... I'm just using bees as, as an example. But what we realize is we know very little about mm -hmm. the roles that every organism plays. And and when which is we... exciting. I know it, ways, it's super right? exciting. It, it can which is why. Be be like, oh no, we don't know anything or it can be like, wow, we actually know very little. And this, 
that same exploration you have for, for space and the curiosity can just be in our soils. That's, that's how I look at it. Exactly. And, and yeah, let's go with the glass half full and, and be, this is, it's truly exciting, but it also reminds us of the urgency. I, I sometimes think that many people outside of, you know, if you, if you have the gardening bug, you're hooked, right. And you, mm-hmm. and you, or the composting bug, it might start with composting. And Peter, I know that you, you already have that bug, but um, it, if for some people, and I'm facing this as Grow Now comes out into the world, when I, this, I mean, this, this book really is a nature-based solution for climate action and supporting biodiversity and, and growing resilient, healthy communities. And, and I want people to understand that. And it gives you the tools then to implement it. But what I'm finding is that people think of it as like this Cute there we go. Yeah. Am Sorry, I just paused. Pause for me. Yeah. All back on it. Uh, but okay, I good. did want to. Anyway. I did want to go on to compost, and because yeah. that is a big part of bringing your soils back to life. And I think that was a really good segue into it. We're talk, we've talked. We've talked about uh, soil life, and then we talked about no de gardening, regenerative gardening. But now, like we mentioned, compost a lot. But now let's actually dive into compost. So making compost, what makes it special? What makes compost special? We've spoken about it a lot. In your words, Emily, what, what's so special about composting? Oh, my goodness. I want to hear your answer <laughs> first. I have so, I, it all depends on what day it is for me, which direction I take this question, because there's, it, it, it's such a layered, fabulous, I mean, it's, it's truly remarkable. What's your answer first? Oh, my answer. Yeah. What's so special about composting? Ah, oh, well, it for me, it's the bridge between life and death. It's mm. this, just this chaos, but also it brings balance as well. So like, that's sort of like when I think about it philosophically, I'm like, wow, like we often like as, as humans, we can get, we get scared of death. Like I, I do. Uh, but it, there is, there is life afterwards, no matter how you want to look at it. And that compost is this cool process, which we can be a part of and see that in everyday life. So like, that's when I think about it philosophical, but on the practical matter, of course, like gardening, uh, climate change, like it just, it makes me feel connected to these bigger problems, but just by doing something simple in my backyard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's honestly, when people ask me, what's the number one thing I can do to help the planet, you know, contribute a positive climate action or contribute towards positive climate action. Uh, and it's compost. It's like make your own compost uh, or, or take your kitchen scraps and your yard waste to a composting hub, mm. uh, but to compost them and then to apply compost to your, your yard, your garden, your landscape. Uh, you know, we, you, I know you've said this on Subpod before and on the Instagram feed for Subpod, I've seen it, that if food waste were a country, it would be the number three climate driver behind uh, the U.S. and China. Yeah. And it's, it's a real statistic. And in the U.S., in 2017, I remember the numbers, I don't, I, the 2018 numbers are out, but it's millions of tons of mm. leaves and yard waste and kitchen scraps go to the landfill where they produce methane gas, which is 28 times more about, right? 28 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And um, when in reality, they could be feeding our our landscapes and in the life equals life equation of of carbon. Uh, I was was really lucky when I started researching for Grow Now to talk to the uh, researchers behind a study in uh, out of UC Davis, which is a university uh, in Northern California, just north of San Francisco. Maybe some of some of the listeners are familiar with it. But they did a 20 year study on the, the real ability. Like, what is it really possible to move carbon from the atmosphere back underground? And what does that look like? What does it take? And they looked at 
two factors. They looked at cover crops and they looked at compost. And they said cover crops are really important. They're really important for feeding the soil. They're really important for protecting the soil, uh, protecting soil structure, helping maintain uh, moisture in soil, moderating temperature, supporting biodiversity. So it's compost. Compost is good at all those things. But it wasn't, it wasn't until they applied this half inch of compost, half inch of compost to the soil surface, that they began seeing uh, marked results of carbon going from the atmosphere underground. And in 20 years, it, it took, it's a decadal process, but over the 20 year course of the study, uh, they saw that at depth, which I, I thought was truly remarkable. It's that half inch. And, and I asked them, okay, so what, if, if I were to tell my readers, one thing they could do, they say, put compost on everything. <laughs> <laughs> just That's everybody's they, gonna be grabbing compost and put it on their face like yeah just, just put it on everything just, just go wild um, well, is there different types of different types of quality of compost is there like compost and compost is there a different <laughs> yeah let me let me um yeah. <laughs> uh, if anyone watches the muppets that's from the muppets um i know totally that's a family joke but um yeah, so we've talked about this before getting on this on this webinar. Mm -hmm. Boy, you have to be careful where you're, if you're buying compost. One, of course, buy as local as possible because it doesn't have to move as far. It doesn't have to travel as far. You don't have uh, those miles added into the making of the compost where that compost had to travel. Um, but yeah, if you're just working with fir bark and I don't know, whatever else they're throwing in it, then it's it's fine but is it living does it smell great is it you know does it look and feel alive uh maybe not maybe that's not the best compost for what you're what you're doing maybe that's fine for an area that you don't really want to grow like you might put wood chips on the ground in areas where you want to prevent weed growth or whatever it might be uh, but yeah compost there are there's definitely varying qualities. And as soon as you start making your own compost or interacting with it, you'll begin to understand what those qualities are right away. It won't take long. That's a really good, that's a great explanation. Cause I think some people, and I know I did it at the start, it's like, no, I'll just buy some compost here and, and um, yeah, be the, be the same. It's, it's cheaper. It takes so long for me to make compost, but when you're making your own compost at home, you can start to inoculate that with some of the rather crummy compost. That's what I usually do. I make a compost tea, put it together, and then those microbes in there, because a lot of the compost you buy has gone through an industrial process. They have they kill off pathogens, but they also kill off beneficial microbes. It's like, all right, you've got a good stock here. Spread that around. Um, but making compost, Emily, can you share a little bit about how you make compost and what's the best method for you? Yeah, yeah, so... I, I actually have a sub pod. So I, I, I use my sub pod for my kitchen scraps and I'm in the process of, I have a, I have a leaf bin where, my, where I make leaf mold. Uh, and on the leaf mold front, leaves are incredibly important for the, our ecosystems. And I, I'm careful to only take some leaves from certain areas, especially if they've blown into the street or they're on my deck or, um, wherever it might be, these impermeable surfaces. And I leave leaves under trees and other places where they're actually feeding those plants uh, that they came from. Uh, but I make leaf mold. Uh, leaf mold is, is uh, uh, nature's compost, and it is one of the best uh, uh, mediums for starting your seeds. It's a great seed starting medium. It can allow you to avoid uh, the peat versus, say, coconut core issue. Uh, um, if, we, if you can avoid, pe avoid peat at all costs, um, please do mm -hmm. so because peat moss is not sustainable or any, yeah. any type of peat. Peat lands in general, harvesting from peat lands is not sustainable uh, and it's detrimental to the environment. So I, I do collect leaves for a small amount of leaves for leaf mold for um, things such as seed starting. And then I'm, I remember I just moved a year ago. Uh, and so I'm finally building a three bin compost system because I, I have a half acre now where before I just had a deck garden and a worm bin was sufficient. Now I have a half acre, I have lots of um, yard waste or yard waste. I hate to use the word waste because it's like the life equals life equation. It takes life mm -hmm. to make life. And so these trimmings and anything I pull from the garden, um, even if it's like the, 
the lettuce after it's gone and bolted and I don't need all the seeds that can go into the three bin system where all my kitchen scraps go into the worm bin. That's great. I love that multiple systems and I'm the same way. I of course I've got my sub pod. It's, it's right near my house and and that's like just it's closer than my bin like uh the garbage bin so i'm like all right of course i'm going to go there first it's just easier but then i've got the hot compost which is for a lot of those yard trimmings i have a bakashi system as well because hey i want to put some stuff under my sink but like that diversity it sounds like you've got the same idea it's just like yeah just do a little bit of everything and combining them all uh, mm -hmm. i realize that we've got a bunch of questions and i know we've, i just got excited with the conversation but we've got about 10 great questions from the audience. Uh, do you think we can, we'll try to answer them as quick as possible to go, yeah. go, go through them all so we get through to everybody. But if not, we will uh, answer these questions, I'll answer them in the Grow Hub afterwards. Uh, so I'll just jump into the first one. We did have this poll running, uh, Emily, I don't know if you saw while you I were talking, it, yeah. but it's what's oh, your yeah. experience with composting? I compost, but I don't think I'm doing it right was the number one so i've never composted i'm compost but i don't think i'm doing it right i feel confident with composting i think that's really common that i see people have this plateau area of i don't think i'm doing it right and just go back to that curiosity the smell like if it smells right if it looks right if it feels right like those are your indicators and like i i hate giving people rules and like you have to do this put this much carbon in put this much food waste because it's like no nature doesn't follow a rule book and I love that, like going back to your idea, Emily, of that NQ and yeah, we can keep talking about that, but I'll get, I'll jump on some of these questions. Lisa, I hope you're still here. She asks, is it worthwhile to get a soil analysis? I, I actually think it's a great benchmark for comparison when you're starting a new garden, especially if it's a garden in the ground. I do think it's great. And I, 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 Primarily for me, I was looking at uh, one, the pH. It, it helps too. You can have your soil analyzed for um, toxins, heavy metals. That's a specific soil test you'd have to look into. Uh, but also um, for me, I wanted to know how much organic matter was in my soil for the very reasons we're talking about. I wanted to know how much carbon was in my soil so that through the regenerative process, I thought my, my garden will be the perfect case study through regenerating the space because it was a, an abandoned lawn weed field nothing had been done to it and by regenerating that space how much carbon could i put it back into the soil so i i tested my soil for that okay great uh next question i'm not going to be able to say this right uh, uh, emily mentioned placing compost on top of the poor soil not digging in and mixing compost how does that impact clay soil Good question. Yeah. yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. Depends on the quality of the clay soil, uh, and if it's it there is there are there are circumstances where if it's it's an incredible hard pan of clay and it's uh, really you you don't anticipate it um, improving quickly, you can fork that soil instead of turning it, fork that clay soil and then put, put compost on top. But I have found that I have actually clay soil out here as well. And I found that I gave it a full year, sheet mulch. Uh, no, I didn't plant in this right away to give a full year, sheet mulch. So put, um, put a layer, I used cardboard, layer of cardboard down, wet that cardboard. And I actually um, invested about four inches of compost on it. Mm -hmm. And a year later, the soil's incredible. And it's, there's still a clay layer about a foot down, but now that I'm going to be planting in it, then I'm going to let nature do its work. And that's going to break up the clay. That's brilliant. I'm going to try. Uh, yeah, that's great to hear because I've got clay soils too. Uh, we've got a, I love this question next from William. How does this dense planting approach reconcile with the spacing and planting advice on the back of seed envelopes, planting round two of my greens and veggies effort this year? planning round two of my veggie. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Good question. How yeah, does that's that? a great, that's a great question. And it kind of goes back to something we were talking about earlier, which is know the rules so you can break them. Uh, and, mm. and I, I say that I say that tongue in cheek because there are some plants that will um, uh, 
they will be really unhappy if you crowd them too much. And there are some plants who are happy to be crowded and you will quickly learn what those plants are. But, um, but it comes back to common sense in that, you know, if you're growing tomatoes and you know those tomatoes need a lot of sun, then you know that crowding them will inhibit the ability of sun to penetrate uh, your tomato patch. Uh, and it, so if you're, if you're also then considering interplanting and growing a variety of plants, that's why I really think that intense planting works really well is if you're mixing plantings and you're not just crowding all of your tomato plants in one spot, me using tomatoes is the go-to, uh, but um, that's something to consider is interplanting. Uh, if you have say a slug problem, uh, then yeah, you're gonna wanna give your lettuce plants a little more room. Uh, if you have problems with powdering mildew, you're gonna wanna give your plants a little more room so air can circulate. And that goes back to curiosity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but the, the other thing to consider is, is how, once you have your garden for a little while, you'll see how plants volunteer themselves and where they plant themselves and mm. use that as cues. And, and if they do volunteer, sometimes I just let things grow. Actually, I was gonna show that to the group. If I was out in the garden, I'm doing just that. I'm letting some plants, um, some mustard that I love so much. And I can't find the seed packet. I can't remember which ones they are. So I'm just gonna let them reseed because I harvested from them for nearly a year. I'm gonna let them reseed. And then when I let them reseed, I'm gonna just watch and see where they plant themselves and how they grow. And I think that's an important cue as well. But know that, uh, that the, the seed packet recommendations are recommendations uh, and you might in your garden need to plant things farther apart or closer together. But I tend to crowd things a little bit, but not overly because I found with overcrowding um, it can res result in its own set of problems. That's, that's great. I love that because, yeah, I often had that. I've had this question before when being introduced to permaculture, like what well, the seed packet said this, but all of a sudden you see this crowding and of course you go into a, a forest and there is crowding there and everything's yeah. growing. So that's, again, following the curiosity. I never thought about that aspect of where the volunteers are then obviously they won't really want to grow there. Uh, Cause that's really cool. Um, I, I, there's a lot of questions here about composting. And so instead of going through them, we do have a webinar later today with Dr. Compost. And so we'll answer those over the grow hub and um, uh, yeah, dive into those questions a little bit deeper, but I just wanted to use the last minute to give a big, big thank you to Emily. Uh, give another shout out to her book, Grow Now. Uh, if there's any last last words of wisdom or anything you want to share, Emily, like, yeah, please do, because I really, really appreciate your time here. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I love what you do. And and I've so appreciated meeting you. And um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about Grow Now, of course, and, and the urgency of this. And I, I think that urgency and, and hope from this and I, I think that we've covered everything. I think that mm. I think that the takeaway would be to foster your nature quotient and mm. to and I'm using that as the term, but but um, look for ways to connect with nature. And I know that might sound hippy dippy. I did grow up in a college town in Humboldt <laughs> County up north, and so technically I am a hippie. But um, but but it's real. We we. I think when we remember our connection with the earth and um, and with plants and other organisms through means such as composting, making compost, growing some of your own food, growing habitat for for wildlife, um, that we're growing habitat for ourselves as much as for these creatures and living things. And and again, we're only as healthy as the environment in which we live. And we can boost our health through through uh, an increased nature quotient and all that comes with it and curiosity, connectivity, and, and there's real learnings in that. And if we trust ourselves and give ourselves courage uh, to try, experiment and fail, just think how good you'll be at composting mm -hmm. if you do it for a whole year, right? Um, it's the same with anything. So th those, are my, those are my last few words of advice is to trust yourself, uh, pay attention, be curious. Trust yourself to build courage and curiosity. Yeah, it seems like those are the big themes throughout there. And yeah, some people might have wanted to know step by steps and they got some 
simple simple wisdom of curiosity because it does it does come back to it right like the best teacher is going to be yourself in the garden uh, mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much emily i really appreciate your time thank you everybody for joining in today uh there will be a replay that will be uploaded on our grow hub community uh, so you'll be able to see that uh, we'll upload that later today have some transcripts and, and chapters in there for you to easily go through everything uh, but thank you thank you everybody keep gardening out there and if you have any questions throw them in there we'll still be doing this and keep answering have a great day everybody thank Take you care. thanks so see much. ya bye, bye.